For the past several months, Filipino doctors have hurriedly taught themselves how to diagnose and treat COVID-19 patients. Many of the protocols, diagnostics, therapies, and discharge criteria have been arbitrarily set up. As newer knowledge came, this rapidly changed. Today, we will tackle the clinical issues in the care of COVID-19 patients. Welcome to TVUP. This is your host, Dr. Teddy Herbosa. For today's episode, we have as our special guest, Dr. Anthony Liachon. Dr. Liachon studied medicine at the Pontifical University of Santo Tomas and graduated in 1985. He subsequently took his fellowship in cardiology at the Department of Internal Medicine at the University of the Philippines, Philippine General Hospital. He became the medical director of Pfizer Philippines. Later, he joined us as a syntax advocate and became president of the Philippine College of Physicians. He also became an independent board member of the PhilHealth and is now a special advisor to the National Task Force Against COVID-19. Dr. Liachon, welcome to Health Issues. Hi, Ted. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share knowledge and expertise to our stakeholders. Thank you very much. And indeed, uh, the hospital where you practice, Manila Doctors Hospital, was one of the first hospitals to actually receive a lot of COVID-19 patients and several of our doctor colleagues were also infected with COVID-19. How was your clinical practice in cardiology affected by this uh, entry of COVID-19 in the Philippines? Well, na, my, my cardiology practice has changed a lot, not only my clinical practice, but the entire medical staff of the Manila Doctors Hospital. In fact, there's a criteria that if you are above 60 and you have hypertension and you have diabetes, you are not allowed to go on duty. So there was this particular okay. time when the residents and the fellows uh, were on duty and supported by younger consultants from age uh, 35 up to about 50 because they want, they don't want the the uh, senior senior uh, consultants to be affected by COVID. So for the last 60 days, I have not been holding clinic, but um, I have been resorting to telemedicine and uh, mm -hmm. been working with you uh, daily at Correct. the National Task Force. Correct. So we, we served the country after we were called to be special advisors of the National Task Force. But tell me more about uh, Manila Doctors Hospital was the recipient of some of the initial cases in Manila. And uh, how did the healthcare workers at the hospital feel at that time? Uh, how did your colleagues feel about managing this very new uh, disease, COVID-19? You, you know, Manila Doctors Hospital is a strategic area where uh, a lot of cases are being referred. And you know that Manila Doctors is almost the extension of the UPPJs. Most of our consultants about 80% are coming from the Philippine General Hospital. You see, the, the best and the brightest uh, physicians are practicing in our hospital. Um, that's the reason why some of the uh, high-profile cases were seen at the Manila Doctors Hospital because of their expertise. And during the initial stages of the COVID, um, they, they, of course, we did not recognize that it was first COVID. And only after a flurry of deaths, then we recognized it. And uh, as you can see, some of our dear colleagues, one of your classmates, uh, perished uh, during this particular Correct. period before we can actually adjust. So we're right now adjusting and we're doing well. Uh, so far, uh, the, the younger consultants are not on duty right now. And... Um, the residents and the fellows are back right now, and we have adjusted to the the uh, cert the situations right now. Um, but your your clinic is still not cases. open, correct? Right. Uh, we'll be open next week, uh, June one. Okay. Uh, actually, the Badila doctors as as uh, as open as uh, right now. The doors to some patients, elective cases, but 
mostly are actually on telemedicine. Uh, next week on June 1, next Monday, uh, we will be holding clinic on a gradual basis, uh, okay. twice a day, twice, uh, twice a week, and for a limited period of time, two to four hours. And the rest will be on telemedicine. Wow, very interesting. And really, our uh, health system has totally changed because of COVID-19. Now, Tony, let's talk about the clinical course of a COVID-19 patient. What are the clinical or his, uh, historical findings that make you suspect that you are treating a patient with COVID-19? Based on my based on my readings and experience at the Manila Doctors Hospital, um, you would trace it to a a patient who traveled abroad uh, in areas with with COVID. We had cases from um, Filipinos returning Filipinos from the U.S. and Australia, and 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 confined at the Manila Doctors Hospital, and uh, of course infecting of course the some of our medical staff and even our consultants, mostly are basically those exposed from um, um, endemic areas, but. Uh, in the second week of the infection, most are actually local transmission coming local. from some of the patients and, of course, the medical staff. So these are the ba basic things. And then they would present you... What do they usually with, complain? Yeah. They usually complain of fever, cough, fever. and then shortness of breath. And then initially, okay. uh, the, so we, the first strategy was to close down the outpatient department. And we would and we only have the emergency room as the as the entry point and for the triaging system. So and that triggered actually the the, the closing of our uh, clinics because we don't want porous borders. So okay. And then we adjusted and then assigned certain uh, floors as COVID area and then for PUI cases. And then separated okay. the clean the cleaner patients. So that was the strategy before. And um, the initial uh, presentations of the patients are basically upper respiratory symptoms, but the more severe ones would present with um, fever, cough, and difficulty of breathing with classic uh, pneumonia. But the pneumonia here is quite different from the usual pneumonia. We see this uh, white lung. Uh, in, in medicine, when we see mm, white okay. lungs are actually uh, we already distress syndrome, and they would require very high oxygenation, leading to um, intubation. That is the put the um, putting on an, a tube uh, right there from your throat down to your lungs, and then would need to hook to a mechanical ventilator. And sadly, uh, seventy to eighty percent of these patients who are hooked to a me mechanical ventilator would expire because of the severe pneumonia and other cardiovascular as well as renal complications or kidney complications. So what was the percentage of the critically ill versus those that would recover uh, with COVID? With, uh, there were more that actually recovered than those that became critically ill and died, right? Right. 80% right. um, of the patients would present uh, with mild symptoms and they usually are confined in the floors. And then uh, about 10 to 20 percent of cases uh, would present with severe symptoms, and they will be confined in the ICU. Um, uh, mostly, they would they would require ventilator, but in, but uh, eventually we adjusted to the system uh, because of our readings. Uh, we would we would like to prevent mechanical ventilation, given the high. Um, uh, incidence rate of dying because of the ventilation and hospital acquired pneumonia. So we would use a um, high flow nasal cannula um, in order to avert using the mechanical ventilator and put the patients on what we call a prone position rather than the usual supine or anterior position because of the compression of the diaphragm on the lower portion and then decreasing, of course, the compliance of the lungs. So we see a lot of patients improving with the prone position and averting, of course, the intubation as well as the mechanical ventilator. And uh, with, with readings and uh, webinars, uh, listening to our Chinese uh, 
counterparts, we were able to master it and eventually um, out of the uh, particular respiratory failures. And uh, the batting average right now when we are treating patients would be about 70 to 80% would be recovering. Uh, during That's the initial good. period, during the initial period, there was this uh, controversy on the use of certain uh, drugs for compassionate use. For the information of the public, when we mean compassionate use, they are drugs that are used for certain indications that are in the market, but may be used based on certain small studies that will save the patient. So we usually ask the, the, uh, the relatives and the family to explain that this particular use may be on a compassionate basis or experimental use in order to save the patients. Now, we know for a fact that um, during the initial period, we use anti-malarial drugs like hydros hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine together with acetromycin. And then we use the, uh, some other drugs. And uh, as of late, uh, we know already that the hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine based on the latest FDA announcement that you cannot use this because of the propensity to develop irregular heartbeats or cardiac arrhythmia Correct. Uh, because of the prolongation of their QT interval. That's a cardiologist's uh, uh, language or term, but it means that when you use the drug, it may compromise the, the patient's cardiac condition by cr creating more problems like arrhythmia, and that can lead to sudden cardiac death. So there are certain other drugs um, that may be used like some uh, um, HIV drugs and antiviral. The remdesivir has been approved in the United States for use. Um, the problem here is that we have some problems in the supply chain, but eventually we might have that in the market. And of course, the, the last resort, of course, is the vaccine, but which may not be available until one and a half years from now. Okay. Uh, okay, so you, we've described several of the therapies that are all being undergoing trials still, right? And uh, let's talk about testing. Uh, how do you diagnose and uh, confirm that you are indeed treating a COVID-19 uh, patient? Okay. What are the, the tests, different tests available to you? The, the gold standard is actually the RT-PCR. We call it the nasopharyngeal swab. And uh, usually, you, you request this when the patients would present with respiratory uh, symptoms like uh, cough or sore throat or those with uh, fever. Uh, and because of the uh, bottleneck uh, situation during the first time, the results would come out after seven days. And then that may be a problem. So we start with usually with our empirical and uh, other drugs uh, to be used for the patient, um, it's a it's a so long. So can you process. repeat that? You you do a test for the. We usually repeat uh, that twice. RT PCR. You get a RT sample PCR. inside the nose. Uh, but we you start treatment the already. In the, the, the throat, and then uh -huh. we put that particular specimen in a in a in a tube. Viral and transport then we tube. Out, right, and then we right. send this out to a center, uh, accredited by the Department of Health. And Correct. during that time, um, there was only one center at that time. It's our ITM. Right now, yes. we have about more than 30 laboratories accredited by the Department Correct. of Health. So that is the usual scenario. So our, our hospital is not considered a, a COVID hospital. Uh, mm -hmm. We're not also a hospital with this particular uh, laboratory. The, the other alternative... Uh, test that we usually uh, do, particularly in areas without the RT-PCR. So we went around um, with Secretary Galvez and Dr. Erbosa and our team. And in the countryside, when you don't have RT-PCR, the, the rapid antibody test may, might be handy. It's a point, a point of care of test where usually you, you will detect the antibody. The first antibody uh, to rise is the IgM, that is about one or one to seven days during the time of the viral shedding. And then this will go down, the IgM, and then you will see a rise in your uh, IgG, and that would mean a past infection or recovery or have immunity. 
but we we would like to emphasize that we would use this uh, together with the RT PCR, just in case we, we would like to validate whether this patient had really, you know, the, the coronavirus infection. So we're, we're using this. Then the, the third one is the gene expert, uh, which you can use uh, using the, the test for tuberculosis. The, the test would run for about 45 minutes. The main problem is that it is not um, available in other areas. So in our discussion here at the National Task Force, uh, we would recommend the RT-PCR in areas where there are centers where you can use it. But in other areas, then you can probably use it, particularly for, uh, for contact tracings, those for uh, clearance, let's say, from our overseas workers that will be going to their final destination after a quarantine of 14 days. Uh, those would require a medical clearance before they return to work. These are the certain uh, medical conditions. We need to explain that to the employers and to the employees and the patients that in the absence of the RT-PCR, rather than not using anything, then perhaps the rapid antibody test uh, might be used. So this is the way we do it right now. Uh, we are not in a business as usual mode. We are in a crisis situation knowing that we believe science and, of course, research. But uh, we need to be flexible because of this particular crisis. Oh, thank you. There's been a lot of controversy with this testing. There are talk of what is the, they call mass testing. And then there's what they call the, the RT-PCR, which is a nucleic... Oh, it tests for the virus, right? It looks for the RNA of the virus. And the other one, the antibody, looks for the antibodies produced by the patient. So why are there uh, sectors or doctors who refuse to use the antibody test? And what are their uh, claims to this? Well, the, the, basically because uh, as, uh, as epidemiologists or researchers, they may actually, uh, you know, focus on their, focus on their expertise to use that. But as a public, of not only the medical aspect, but the socio-economic impact of your certain diagnostic tools. Um, for example, when I was at PGH, there was no CT scan, there was no MRI scan, but we were able to manage cases clinically. And I learned this from you about the syndromic uh, diagnosis that you can actually blend using clinical symptoms and signs together with the minimum diagnostic tool to arrive at a diagnosis. We, we were instructed by Secretary Galvez to use available diagnostic tools in order to save lives. In a crisis situation, this is very important. We don't want to, uh, we don't want, of course, to uh, stay away from science and research, but this is the issue right now. And we need to be adaptive and of course, calibrate our moves based on the present situation. So you feel that uh, the use of the antibody test and the PCR test are complementary to each other? Ab absolutely. And, and we discussed this at the Philippine College of Physicians that uh, though, though the medical societies um, have issued you know, this, this particular statement, one particular caveat here is that uh, they will not uh, enforce or perhaps influence the employers to use whatever diagnostic tools in order to protect their, their patients and their employees. And as we speak right now, uh, this morning, Secretary uh, Ed Año of the DILG uh, said that um, he would uh, conduct a Zoom meeting together with the local government units in order to explain the use of the RT-PCR and the rapid antibody test, depending on the situations. And eventually, uh, he would uh, 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 advise the IATF through the technical, uh, through the task force strat communications to issue uh, a final statement so that we will not confuse, of course, the Filipino population. So uh, let's talk about the antibody test. There, is, uh, there are like three bars. We call it a lateral flow test. Uh, you can also test the antibody using the ELISA, which is a machine or a lab. 
But uh, in the lateral flow, it diagnoses uh, there are three bars in that kit. In that kit, there is like a control, and then there's the IgM and the IgG. So what does it mean when you have a positive IgM? When you have a positive IgM, it means that you are or in the first week. Usually, the incubation period is about 14 days. And then you have a pre-symptomatic case. A symptomatic case is defined as a, a, this is the absence of symptoms. But the, the difference between uh, coronavirus and SARS is that during, in, in SARS, you can actually be contagious during the time of the uh, symptoms. But the main difference is that coronavirus, you can be contagious or can infect another person even if you're asymptomatic or you're, you're in the pre-symptomatic case. Now, the IgM would rise during the first seven days, usually about yes. three to seven days. That is the first antibody response. That is the response of the body uh, because of the infection. Increase right now of the immunoglobulin G, which would mean that you actually develop immunity. Of course, we don't know yet the full course of the disease because we are right now in the midst of crisis. We don't know yet whether we will have full immunity uh, with this particular virus or we would have total immune, uh, herd immunity once uh, 70 to 90 percent of the population is exposed. So a lot of things are not sure right now. So, so, so therefore, what we would like to advise is to Keep, of course, the social distancing measures and the proper etiquette while we uh, unveil some of the studies related to this particular problem. So we visited Baguio City, and in Baguio City, uh, Mayor Magalong and Baguio General Hospital implemented this uh, artificial intelligence together with the CT scan findings. Uh, can you tell us more about the use of uh, AI? in the diagnosis of the pneumonia of a uh, patient with COVID-19? Actually, Ted, I did that uh, in the country. Uh, for example, Dr. Kamp, proponent of the prone position, uh, CT scan of the chest, and they can do the, the chest CT scan in order to see whether there are grass, ground glass opacities. Now, um, this particular uh, gadget or technology uh, that is uh, sponsored by Huawei, can actually, you can have, actually have the results in seven minutes. And even in the absence of the RT-PCR results, you can actually manage the case as a COVID pneumonia. And according to Mayor Magalong, the correlation rate uh, after extracting the, the specimen and then the results of the chest scan is actually about 80 to 90 percent. That's a very good uh, uh, diagnostic rate and in terms of uh, efficiency, I would say that this is accurate. Now, we have the same experience at the Manila Doctors' Hospital. Uh, mm -hmm. Since the turnaround time will be about five, seven days, we usually use the chest x-ray, the syndromic diagnosis, and the chest CT scan. And this is one of the success stories, of course, of using multiple diagnostic tools in order to save a patient and not be, be too dependent on one diagnostic tool which is the RT-PCR, which is considered the gold standard. Good, very good. Uh, can you tell us more about uh, a, pro a research program of the WHO called the Solidarity Trial? I think they're trying to study all the uh, proposed therapies out there. The, the Solidarity Trial is a, a multi-study uh, led by the World Health Organization. And that includes, of course, the, the Philippines. The, the lead proponent in the Philippines is the president of the Philippine Society of Microbiology and Infectious Disease. That is, in order to, to tell us, uh, find out what part the, whether those uh, drugs used for compassionate use or for experimental use, would, and this would uh, be comprised of the anti-malarial drugs, together with your antiviral drugs, together with your HIV drug, and of course some medications, of course, for your connective tissue diseases. And the results will be out in a few months. But um, as you can see, 
uh, the FDA has uh, announced that the hydroxychloroquine may not be effective and it may be deleterious to your patient. Without um, waiting for the solidarity trial, then you can actually be following this particular guideline. Then remdesivir has been found to be effective in reducing drugs can actually more be deleterious rather than used for the patient. My idea as discussed with you, Ted, is that we don't want the patients to be admitted in the hospital because it's very expensive. As you can see, based on uh, my patient's experience, one patient would would spend about 1.5 million, and I heard about wow. um, many patients um, spending so much on this. So you don't want to be confined for two reasons. One, it's very expensive. Number two, the uh, prolonged hospitalization can lead to intubation and use of your mechanical ventilator. Number three, you cannot visit or your your relative. And the other reason is that the, the members of the family may not actually be may actually be affected as well. So you should you should uh, focus more on the preventive aspect. And the idea is to have more testing centers to detect and isolate and trace the patients, rather than be uh, rather than be confined and over or overwhelm the healthcare system. So in the new normal, the idea is to be um, more focused on the preventive or upstream cases, more on detection, isolation, um, tracing, rather than treating the cases in the hospital. Correct. And then overwhelm again the healthcare system. There's another form of therapy that's going around in a few of the hospitals in Manila, and it's called plasma therapy. You know, you get a patient who already had uh, COVID-19 and recovered, and they get their plasma to plasma fertilizers. Can you explain the principle behind plasma therapy for COVID-19? The, the plasma therapy has been used as, as well in Manila Doctors Hospital and some other local hospitals. The, the principle is that once the patient has recovered, then the, the patient who was then affected with COVID, a period of time uh, of recovery, then you can actually donate or, or uh, the white, they call it the white of the blood or the plasma. And then this usually will be extracted from you and then bunk in, uh, in the laboratory of, let's say, the, I think, there are only a few hospitals offering this, the Philippine General Hospital and St. Luke's at this moment. And then when there are severe cases of uh, COVID, for example, in the, in the ICU, then this particular plasma can be used in order to increase, uh, of course, success. But we need to understand that we need um, a clinical trial to find out whether these patients would have other side effects aside from its efficacy. We want to test here the efficacy rate as well as the safety. But based on our understanding and based on the stories of those our patients who recovered, uh, plasma therapy has a role, of course, in the treatment regimen of the patients. Thank you, Tony. The one last and final question. What is your fearless forecast on the vaccine? Coming from the pharmaceutical industry, I was uh, connected with Pfizer for two decades and we produce the best uh, drugs as well as vaccines. Uh, usually in order to uh, launch a product in the market, you need a billion dollars to launch a product in the market. And uh, based on our projection, this is vaccine, uh, you might need one and a half years minimum, minimum to two years to launch a vaccine in the market, particularly with this kind of virus when you have other problems. So, and therefore, based on this assumption, the new normal may be actually from, from today and then the next two years before we can see uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you very much. It's been a very good discussion. Any final words for our viewers? I, I think we need to be resilient and relentless in, in trying to pursue um, the vaccine for this particular pandemic. I would like to advise everyone as we open the economy uh, next week uh, from, ME, from ECQ to MECQ to GCQ, we must maintain our social distancing measures. And I would actually enjoin everyone 
every Filipino to have a culture of discipline and commitment. Thank you very much, Ted, for the opportunity to enlighten our viewers. Thank you very much, Tony. That was a very interesting discussion. Like you, I do hope that we will find the right therapy through the solidarity trials and in a year or two be able to commercially produce vaccines against COVID-19. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. This is your host, Dr. Teddy Herbosa. Stay home, stay safe.